say goodbye to dad's old car of the 50s and say hello to the horsepower wars of the 60s and the official birth of American muscle. By the time the 1960s rolled in, the big three automakers of GM, Ford, and Dodge were invigorated with new and younger executives who wanted to reimagine the automotive world. This included newer and sharper designs, and of course, larger and more powerful V8s under the hood. Cars like the 409 Impala, 413 Mopars, and 406 Galaxies were seemingly the kings of the streets and tracks until Pontiac decided to rise above the rest, with a car that would seemingly be the stuff of legends and could be regarded as a king of the track in the early 1960s that reached its peak in 1962. Today, we will discuss the factory-built and race-tuned 1962 Pontiac Super Duty Catalina. Which is one of the rarest factory racers that you will ever find. And while all of these super rare factory racers are deep into the six figure range today, maybe after watching this video, you're inspired to build your own replica Catalina on a realistic budget. And instead of browsing through endless eBay listings, Hemmings, and even Facebook Marketplace, you should be using Auto Tempest. Auto Tempest is an enthusiast's dream when it comes to searching for your next project as they have all the cars in one search. With Auto Tempest, you just enter in the vehicle that you are looking for and the radius of your search, and they will collect and display all of the listings of that specific vehicle across all the major listing platforms, so you don't miss out on that diamond in the rough that you have been searching for. Auto Tempest searches everything from cars.com to eBay and countless others, and it even links you to Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace results up to the entire country. I use it when I'm browsing for projects that I definitely don't have the space for, and I know just how much time using Auto Tempest saves. So click the link in the description below to try autotempest.com or use the Auto Tempest app and change the way you shop for your next car. The storied timeline of speed for Pontiac begins in 1956, when an executive named Simon Emil Bunky Knudsen was named general manager of Pontiac. He was far younger than his predecessor, and he desired to bring performance into the company's blood. This yearning for performance started in the late 50s with the creation of the infamous 389 cubic inch Tri-Power V8, which would set a track record at Daytona with a 131.7 mile per hour lap speed, with Knudsen himself behind the wheel of the record-setting car. Now, a real enthusiast was in the captain's seat at Pontiac, and it was time to show it. Knudsen increased Pontiac's motorsport participation in several ways. Starting with a very successful NASCAR racing program, thanks in part to legendary car builder Smokey Eunuch, just before jumping into drag racing and layered speed racing with the assistance of racing legend Mickey Thompson. This new focus on speed and performance all came to a head in 1961 for Pontiac and started the beginning of something truly legendary. By this year, Chevrolet, Ford, and Mopar were all offering cars with engine packages over 400 cubic inches, and Knudsen knew Pontiac would be outgunned. So shortly before the 1961 NHRA U.S. Nationals, Pontiac announced the following. Pontiac is now offering to qualified drivers a 421 cubic inch performance engine option. This engine is rated at 373 horsepower and features dual four barrel carburetors, a solid lifter camshaft, and high capacity exhaust manifolds. The 421 engine was available only with the heavy duty driveline components, and it could be fitted to any Catalina or Ventura two-door model. And this statement would send ripples through the market, and this would become known as the 421 Super Duty package. And it immediately pole vaulted Pontiac back to the top of the racing world. But as a sign that Pontiac was doing something right, not too long after the press release, the NHRA soon mandated that to be eligible for stock competition classes, complete engines must be factory installed, which sparked the official release of the Super Duty Catalina. 
Visually, the new 1962 model year was focused on giving the Catalina a sharper profile and making that beautiful bubble top roof transition into a more aggressive roof line. Up front, the grille was given a flatter look over the laid back grille from years prior. They also modified the taillights and rear fins, which included rotating the taillights and giving the new Catalina a much different style that set it apart from a contemporary Impala. This completed design created arguably one of the most beautiful and pure Pontiacs of the early 1960s. And it was at this point that the racing department at Pontiac decided to figure out how they could shed the pounds with these new Catalinas to make the race ready ones truly a force to be reckoned with. A typical Catalina weighed about 3,550 pounds in complete street trim. The Super Duty Catalinas, on the other hand, were given fenders, inner fenders, hoods, radiator supports, and front bumpers that were all now made of stamped aluminum, which alone shaved off nearly 200 pounds. Radios and heaters were optional, and they even went as far as to cut holes in the frames of some cars that were combined with a reinforced Daytona chassis in 63. This all was part of the $1,200 plus engine option for the specialty prepared Super Duty cars. But what was lying under the hood of this built to race Pontiac. Well, the 421 cubic inch Pontiac is built race ready with a laundry list of parts in it. Essentially, the 421 is a Stroker 389 Pontiac V8. Starting with the engine block, the 421 has a 4.094 inch bore and a four inch stroke with four bolt main caps. And it was given a set of forged Mickey Thompson pistons and forged connecting rods and a forged crank plus a compression ratio of 11 to 1. They then added a special camshaft that was designed by Malcolm McKellar that was paired with 1.65 rocker arms that gave it a pretty radical sound for the era. This 421 was fed by two Carter 500 CFM carburetors run with a mechanical throttle linkage. In 1962, a set of high-flow cylinder heads were also added, including a 2.02-inch diameter intake valve and a 1.76-inch diameter exhaust valve. The engine was also given a high-pressure oil pump and a high-speed propeller shaft with moraine aluminum bearings. This Super Duty 421 was rated at around 405 horsepower at 5,600 RPM and 425 foot-pounds of torque at 4,400 RPM, but motor trend tests in period show that it actually made much closer to 475 horsepower, and even in-race performances show that it may have made way closer to 500 horsepower. Behind this high-power Pontiac 421 sat a heavy-duty clutch, which was paired with either a Borg Warner T85 heavy-duty three-speed manual or a fully synchronized Borg Warner T10 four speed manual with a Hearst floor shifter. And this drivetrain was officially backed up in the back by a safety track posit traction rear end with up to a 430 rear gear ratio, which matched the aggressive spirit of the car perfectly. This combination in the hands of a competent driver was capable of running a low 5 seconds 0 to 60 and high 13s at around 107 miles per hour with a top speed of about 116. But actual race prep cars were much, much, much faster in the quarter mile in around the 12 second range and low 13s. The Pontiac Super Duty Catalina's key to fame was being a drag car and almost purely that. The interior remained very modest as amenities added also meant weight, which was not something that customers of these cars would generally want. The Super Duty car only offered a bench seat or low back bucket seats up front with a Hearst shifter that sat behind a chrome-filled dash that went across the width of the car. It may have been a fairly basic interior, but with the size of the Catalina, it made for a very comfortable two-door that could seat five comfortably if needed for the days that the family wanted to go for a ride in the drag car. But the Super Duty Catalina was anything but just a family car, and the racing prowess in 1962 was virtually unbeatable on every track they ran, in NHRA, and even in NASCAR. Throughout the NASCAR season, the NASCAR-prepped Pontiac Catalinas 
dominated. Joe Weatherly won the NASCAR Grand Nationals Championship, which included nine wins. Jack Smith also ran a Pontiac and won five races and finished fifth overall. Fireball Roberts also managed an eighth place overall finish of the year, as well as 12 top tens and three race wins, including the Daytona 500. On the NHRA side, it seemed to be the same old song and dance, as Hayden Prophet dominated the NHRA Winter Nationals by bringing five Pontiacs, owned by Mickey Thompson with him, to five different racing classes and winning to seal the legend of the Super Duty Catalinas in stone forever. By the end of the year, a total of 179 Super Duties were made in 1962. Of those, only 45 of them, though, were equipped with the full aluminum front clip. By 1963, disaster struck. General Motors put an end to both Chevrolet and Pontiac's factory-supported racing due to GM caving and enforcing the AMA, which is the Automobile Manufacturers Association, Resolution of 1957, which is in large part because of an antitrust investigation from Robert Kennedy. And it seemed to be the best way for GM to sneak away from it was to fully enforce a no racing rule that existed until the late 60s. The Pontiac Catalina Super Duties were truly racing icons of the early 60s, and they remain a perfect example of what happens when you let real racers take charge of an automobile manufacturer. The end product will always be high horsepower, factory built race cars that win championships. And if you ever see one of the sub 200 real Super Duties out there, in the wild, be sure to go and stop by and talk to the owner, as he is likely a crazy story about this car from his youth that encapsulated exactly why he purchased one. Thank you all for watching another episode of our Rare Cars documentary series. If you enjoyed this video, we would greatly appreciate it if you could drop a like and also share this video with other enthusiasts. Also, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Rare Cars YouTube channel and smash the notification bell for more documentary style videos just like this on the world's most interesting cars. Until next time, enthusiasts.